A reading from the book of Joshua, the fifth chapter, beginning at the ninth verse. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening, on the fourteenth day of the month, in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Here endeth the reading. Let's read the appointed section of the Psalter in unison as printed in the leaflet. Psalm 32, blessed is he whose unrighteousness is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth no sin, and in whose spirit there is no guile. For whilst I held my tongue, my bones consumed away through my fear of complaining. For thy hand was heavy upon me, day and night, and, and my moisture was like a drought in summer. I have acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine unrighteousness have I not hid. I said, I will confess my sins unto the Lord, and so thou forgivest the wickedness of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly make his prayer unto thee. In a time when thou mayest be found, surely the great Lord of the floods 
shall not come nigh. Thou art places to hide me in, thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with psalms of deliverance. I will inform thee and teach thee in the way where thou shalt go, and I will guide thee with my eye. Be ye not like to horse and mule, which have no understanding, whose mouths must be held with bit and bridle, else they will not obey thee. Great plagues remain for the ungodly, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord, mercy embraces him on every side. Be glad, O ye righteous, and rejoice in the Lord, and be joyful, all ye that are true in your heart. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the fifth chapter, beginning at the sixteenth verse. From now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given them, us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here end of the letter.
while all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to Jesus to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. <coughs> then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Today we have a familiar story. Should it be called the parable of the two brothers? The story of the gracious father? It has been 
traditionally named the story of the prodigal son. That's not in the Bible, we just gave it that name. And today, people don't even know what prodigal signifies, so maybe the squandering, wasteful son, maybe it should be called that. I hope you all listen to the scriptures as they are read and reflect on them a little bit. That's the purpose of having them read. I want to start this morning with quotation from Alice in Wonderland about believing things that seem impossible. You remember the Red Queen says to Alice, sometimes I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Maybe in church we're asked to believe things that certainly are difficult, if not seemingly impossible. But remember also that Albert Einstein, one of the great minds of, of this present world, Einstein said, if at first an idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. I think we should accept three rather astounding assumptions, three difficult credibilities as we think about this story. First, this story has come down to us through 2,000 years through translators of language, Aramaic to Greek to English. Many evolving intellectual climates have prevailed as these translations have been made. Hand-copied versions of this story were made by monks for many centuries until the printing press came along. Can we believe, this is the difficult credibility, can we believe that we have basically the original parable that Jesus told to read, mark, and inwardly digest? Okay, the second assumption that we have to believe, that we have to accept. Luke Remember, the physician was a friend of St. Paul. He never met Jesus. He never listened to Jesus personally. Yet he was the first one whom we know wrote down the story in the form we have it. He was trying to give us his best judgment as to the story coming from Jesus the anointed one, the Christ. Maybe there was an earlier collection of Jesus' stories and sayings and poems, a so-called Q document, because that is the way Jesus taught. We can be pretty assured of that, that Jesus taught by stories, by sayings, by poetry, which the Beatitudes and the Lord's Prayer are good examples of Jewish poetic form. And of course, Jesus knew that people would remember things better, just like we remember jokes today that we heard 40, 50 years ago, or poems, or the refrains of, of music. We can sing that, hum that music, and the words come right back to our minds, the poems. Even some of the silly commercials that we heard as children so Jesus knew people would remember. And maybe that is the way he taught, and maybe Luke has for us, even though he never himself heard Jesus tell it, the basic outlines and words of this story. Many stories in the Bible, of course, in the New Testament are influenced by the time in which they were written in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 50 years after Jesus' death because the church was undergoing change and persecution and 
that time, and, and some of the stories are retold to reflect that. The most difficult suspension of certainty that we must make, the most difficult supposition, number three, is to suppose that this Jesus was more than just a charismatic teacher. Suppose he was actually the means whereby ultimate reality, the sustaining force of the universe, was trying to communicate with us humans and explain to us something about those ultimate questions we ask. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my destiny? Why is there something and not nothing? What does it all mean? Is there any meaning to existence? Now, if Jesus was that divine revelation to all of us, then maybe he was saying something in this story very important that we should hear and ponder as if our life and being depended on it. Not just remember it, but think about it. Have it influence the way we live. Well, how shall we hear this familiar story again so that it's new? What questions should we ask? Was it about a real family that Jesus knew? Well, probably not. Was it a literary creation of his mind and heart, like the story of Jonah and the whale? Who is the story really about? I think a fundamental question is that story about what God is truly like, or what we should be like. What we should be like. Perhaps it is both what God is like and what we should be like. We know it was given in answer to the criticism, the indignation of the Pharisees and scribes that said right at the beginning, if you listen when I read it, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Who is this fellow? He, he welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's what they were saying. So the story, as the context we have it, is an answer to that challenge. One possible meaning of the story is to concentrate on the Father, the loving, forgiving Father. Is Jesus telling us that is what God, the power behind the universe, that is what God is like? He's like that human Father. And remember, at other times, Jesus said, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 10 righteous people who need or think they need no repentance. There's more joy in heaven over the one who repents. I think this story conforms to that saying of Jesus. So we can think of God not just as the one who lays down the law, the Ten Commandments, but one who forgives and welcomes. And if prodigal also means generous, the story might be called the story of the prodigal father. Surely to the elder brother, this kind of a God cannot be loved. This kind of a God seems to be unfair. But that maybe is what Jesus is telling us. Not that God is unfair, but that God is generous to all, to the good, to the bad, to those who come back at the 11th hour and say no one has hired us.
The second possibility is that we should focus in the story on the presumptuous, wasteful, dissolute young man and his learning about reality the hard way, coming to a humility that acknowledged to himself his foolishness and unworthiness. Maybe Jesus is calling us to look at our lives and acknowledge our own pride and unworthiness and to turn around, which is really the meaning of repent, is to turn around and look in a different way. Can we identify with this young man, his emotions, his folly? Some of us who are older have had a lot of folly in our lives. Maybe if you're younger, you don't realize that you have, even at a young age, had folly in your life, and you're probably going to make a lot more mistakes and things that you regret. So one of the focuses of the story is to make us, I'm sure, think of this young man and how we are like him. And he comes to a true realization. His father's slaves are better off than him. And in some ways forfeited his sonship by being foolish and wasteful and dissolute. And he turns and returns home. The third possibility, of course, is that Jesus wants us to focus in this story on the elder son, who, like the Pharisees, have worked hard all his life to obey the laws of God, of his father, and to work for him. This older son has a relationship with both his father and his younger brother. Can, can we identify with him I think we can identify with his hurt, his sibling jealousy. Many of us, and many of the conservative people in this country, I think we can empathize with their feeling that somehow they or their ancestors came over here and worked hard to build this country, to, to create the fruitful plains that we enjoy, and now others are coming in. Uh, from South America, from other places, uh, who, who are not part of our past and, and receiving the benefits that we work so hard to create. I, I, think, I think that we can understand some of their feeling just as the father understood the feeling of this elder brother. His hurt, his anger, his sense of injustice, but what does the father say to him? In a sense, it's revealed in the word his brother uses to, us, to describe the younger brother and what the father then says back to him. You notice that the younger brother says, or the older brother says, this son of yours, your son, Remind you of Adam saying, the woman you gave to me, she's the one who, uh, who gave me that fruit. The woman you gave to me. Uh, this, this son of yours. And what does the father say? He says, no, it's your brother. Not my son. Your brother was dead and is alive again. I suspect that Jesus wanted to us to identify with all of the characters in this story, both to acknowledge that we share their faults and that we can share their love. Paul tells us in one other place, we are all adopted sons and daughters of God, all brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And that, I believe, is what Jesus wanted us to hear as we listen to this story. In the epistle today, which relates to the gospel, Paul put it very succinctly. And I think this phrase of Paul's, the sentence of Paul's, 
very well goes with the gospel story. What was, what was God doing? What did God do through Jesus? Paul writes, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So in all those situations that remind us of the prodigal son's story, God is telling us to, like the father, go and do thou likewise. Amen. Join me in the words of the creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of my faith. Being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was in the of the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven. And sit on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, and his kingdom shall not no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe in one Holy Catholic and at the Son of Church. I acknowledge one baptism for remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word hast taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, Receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, and Eugene, our bishop, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Donald, our president, Lawrence, our governor, and Catherine, our mayor, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that, rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance, and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, 
to comfort and succor those commended to our prayers and all those who, in this transitory life, are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We pray especially for Tom, Diane, Tim, Alistair, Kemp, Claudia, Joseph, John, Joyce, Vernon, Edith, Gail, Christine, Megan, Sharon, Marilyn, William Andrew, Dean, Richard, Frank, Kate, Ian, Carl, Colleen, Alyssa, Sue, Donnie, Jean, Mike, Randy, Russell, Barbara, Heather, Ted, Sally, Kirsten, Abby, Tim, Arthur, Pamela, the Church of the Advent, and the Church of Grace and St. Peter's. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially thy servants our benefactors, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the exa good examples of Our Lady, Blessed John, and of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess, confess that we have, we have sinned, sinned against, against thee, thee in thought, word, and deed, by, by what we have done, done and by, and by what, what we have left undone. We, we have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are, we are truly sorry, sorry and we humbly repent. repent. For, the For the sake of thy Son, Jesus, Jesus Christ, have mercy, have mercy upon us and forgive us. us that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who in heart and repentance and through faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. This is the true saying and law worthy of all men to be deceived that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the perfect offering for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Amen. 